So let's get Theo up here. Thanks. I was asked to come up here and tell you all about the natural history of Arkansas. And they said, well, how long? What, I got a couple hours or what? And they said, now you got 30 minutes. And I said, oh, this is ridiculous. So anyway, um, I got 200 and uh, some slides, so uh, we'll just get as far as we can, and uh, anyone who's interested can certainly come talk to me after. Okay, so this is a much too quick overview of the natural history of Arkansas. Everyone generally recognizes six major natural divisions, the Ozark Plateau, the Arkansas Valley, the Ouachita Mountains, together comprise the interior highlands, the highest landform in the mid-continent. Um, the balance is the West Gulf Coastal Plain to the south, former Gulf of Mexico, uh, Mississippi Alluvial Plain, as Scott said, called the Delta, and Crowley's Ridge, a low upland ridge of lust, gravel, and sand. It was never eroded away by rivers in eastern Arkansas. Um, I prefer to go ahead and break the Ozark Plateau into two major ecoregions, the Boston Mountains and the uh, Ozark Plateaus. Really very different areas, and I'll talk more about that. The Arkansas Valley, of course, and the Washita Mountains, those four ecoregions, the interior highlands. Even better, let's split it further. Let's split it down to these level four ecoregions. Really uh, a great, when this came out, it just, everything fell into place. All these patterns of distribution, uh, plants and animals kind of made sense to me. And, uh, and you know, let's, let's, let's split it again, is, is what I say. Um, good stuff. I'm um, just going to briefly talk about each one and then talk about some communities uh, that, that are really statewide uh, or at least occur in multiple uh, natural divisions or ecoregions. The Ozark Plateaus, uh, not true mountains. This is a high plateau uh, eroded by streams over long periods of time. The geologic strata are pretty flat. Sandstone, limestone, dolomite, chert, sedimentary rocks. Uh, and, and there's several major ecoregions, we'll say four to five uh, within there, and there are different land surfaces at different heights. The topographic roughness is different. What you see here is the uh, Springfield Plateau gently rolling, uh, the dissected Springfield Plateau behind, and the Boston Mountains sitting up on top, the high land surface. Uh, same thing here, you can see some sinkhole ponds there in the foreground. The Springfield Plateau was historically prairie uh, and open savanna, oak woodland. Let's see if I have a, yeah. Sinkhole ponds there on this karst plain. Uh, more dissected terrain in the background, and again, the Boston Mountains in the, in the way back. The Boston Mountains really split into two separate ecoregions, what we call the High Bostons and the Lower Boston Mountains. The High Bostons, high elevation, uh, up to 2,500 feet. Uh, Deeply dissected, deep gorges. This is the upper Buffalo River. Uh, you can see how rugged it is. And uh, a lot of mesic forest, uh, and deep protected coves below the bluff line. Uh, not a whole lot of fire down in the, in the bluff, below the bluff line historically. So you have a lot of mesic northern and Appalachian influence. Uh, this is what it looks like. Mostly, uh, mostly hardwood, very little native pine up in the high Boston's high elevation. Well, a little more rainfall, um, and uh, you do see pine in old fields and a little bit here and there, but, but predominantly hardwood. The lower Boston's much gentler, uh, very different flora, lower elevation, lots of pine. Uh, you can see there how much pine we're talking about. Some of that's managed, but shortleaf pine woodlands, very... Uh, common uh, historical vegetation type, or shortleaf pine hardwood woodlands in the lower Boston Mountains. This is uh, one of my favorite places, Clifty Canyon Special Interest Area, deeply dissected part of the uh, Ozark Plateaus, a lot of Appalachian influence here, deep, deep gorges. Uh, you can see there's a lot of cedar encroaching in this habitat. Lower Buffalo Wilderness Area, one of the largest roadless areas in the eastern U.S., 40,000 acres. Um, there's the White River Hills, 25 miles of the lower Buffalo River flows unimpeded through here uh, with no access. 
White River Hills, uh, another subsection of the Ozarks, had the big glades. This were the big dolomite glade country. Uh, large landscape scale glades up to uh, a thousand acres or more in a given spot. Most of this is in Missouri, but we do have some spectacular stuff. We've just finished uh, collaborating with some partners from the Central Hardwoods Joint Venture um, to map the glades all across uh, the interior highlands in Missouri and Arkansas. And uh, it's pretty fantastic uh, resource to have, aiding conservation planning, management, inventory, uh, the big glades. A lot of the action in the Ozarks is underground. Um, the Boston Mountains are primarily sandstone, but the other ecoregions have a lot of karst. And there's a lot to be discovered, a lot being discovered. Uh, I don't know what's up with this, but it's not. There we go. Um, conservation partners from a number of agencies and organizations are doing extensive inventory and describing, as Scott mentioned, new species on a regular basis. A lot of endemism in the Ozark karst. A lot of great species. So just a few examples of the Fushy Cave Snail. A, uh, these are all very globally rare G1, uh, federally listed species. Um, two endemic cave crayfish, the blind Ozark cavefish. Number of cave invertebrates endemics. Number of rare bat species, the Ozark big-eared bat being the most uh, probably the most at risk of all of these. Uh, gray bat, Indiana bat, northern long ear bat, some uh, cave salamanders. Uh, we did, uh, unfortunately, document white nose syndrome in Arkansas in the last couple of years, and it is spreading and having an impact on our bats here as well as it has to the north and east. Related to these karst features underground, we have some botanically interesting uh, above ground features like sinkhole ponds. Uh, a lot of rare species occur in these sinkhole pond wetlands. Uh, a lot of fluctuating water margins. And these are ancient ponds, so they may not be very big, but they've been there for a very long time. And the statistical probability of arrival of unusual things in these habitats is, is uh, feasible at least. And we find a lot of really fascinating plant species and rare things in these sinkhole ponds. Um, glades, another really uh, important interior highlands uh, natural community. These are rocky, treeless, naturally treeless openings in an otherwise forested landscape. Uh, they occur on different geological substrates. Each one has a slightly different flora. These are desert habitats. They have a lot of drought adapted, um, what we can, people think of southwestern type species like uh, yucca, sedum, prickly pear cactus. We have four species of prickly pear cactus in Arkansas in these glades, uh, one of which is very rare, Opuncha nemoralis. Rock pinks, false aloe, typical glade species of plants. Some desert adapted ferns. And some interesting fauna. A lot of the uh, this is the eastern collared lizard, which is a species of conservation concern, and the ground snake. Uh, a lot of the species in these glades and barrens will bite or sting. Uh, a lot of interesting sort of western affinities we see here. Scorpions, tarantulas, etc. And my personal favorite glade animal, the giant red-headed centipede. Um, nothing to fool with. Has a really painful bite, and if you don't think it's mean, you can probably see that it's eating a scorpion. Uh, some really fascinating rare species of plants in glades and barrens and a lot of endemics. This is the flat rocks tick seed disjunct from uh, the flat rock glades, uh, igneous glades and sandstone glades from Alabama and Georgia. Uh, is found uh, in a localized area of sandstone flat rock glades in the eastern Ozarks. Western disjuncts like cedar sedge. Here's a sinkhole pond with a glade complex around the margins. Pretty, pretty incredible uh, landscapes up there. Uh, we have a lot of, related to this karst, we have a lot of springs and seeps and groundwater fed wetlands. This is Mammoth Spring. It's the second largest spring in the Ozark, one of the largest in the country. Flows nine million gallons an hour. Basically an entire river just blows out of the ground at Mammoth Spring right on the Missouri border. 
and uh, cold water, a lot of uh, interesting flora. Historically, actually until very recently, a population of the Ozark Hellbender is now extirpated in Spring River, uh, we believe, but uh, was there until recently. Uh, endemic crayfish associated with a lot of these mountain spring-fed rivers. Uh, this is the mammoth spring crayfish, G2. Bluffs in the Ozarks, major habitat for uh, a lot of rare plant species, also some rare invertebrates like snails. Um, one of my favorite sites is the Nars of the Buffalo River, uh, loaded with western disjuncts, finding uh, species there from the Edwards Plateau of Texas and westward. Uh, fascinating area. Watch your step. Two feet wide, 80 foot drop on both sides. Uh, waterfalls, box canyons, you also have these sort of mesic um, habitats, and often in, in very close proximity to these really xeric uh, glade-like habitats. You'll have a, a rim rock glades across on top of the bluff, a short drop down the bluff, and be in very mesic uh, habitat. Uh, a fine uh, scale change, uh, diversity on a, on a small spatial scale. A lot of interesting disjunct species in these habitats. Uh, rare things like the ovate leaf catchfly from the southeast. Uh, this is actually an endemic, a variety that's endemic to the, the Ozarks, the Arkansas alum root, uh, the species as a whole is disjunct from the Appalachians. Alabama snow wreath on bluffs, mesic bluffs and talus. Umbrella magnolia, similar uh, Appalachian disjunct. Carolina silver bells. Just a few examples. Broadleaf bunch flower was known historically in Arkansas, and we found it again uh, in the last year or two at that Clifty Canyons area. I showed a, an aerial photo of a lot of interesting eastern disjuncts there. Northern disjuncts like uh, white rattlesnake root. Rocky Mountain disjuncts on bluffs in the Ozarks like the uh, yellow monkey flower. And uh, other bizarre western or eastern disjuncts. Bowman's root, yellow mandarin, um, Father Gilla, or witch alder. Perhaps not the same thing. The Washita Mountains, a uh, very different place. The true mountains, this is a westward analog or extension of the Appalachians, folded, faulted, very rugged, divided into several uh, ecoregions or ranges. The Cossatot Mountains, the most rugged part in the southern Washita's. Very, very rugged terrain, geologically complex. Novaculite, sandstone, shale, chert. Uh, many strata formed or exposed on a, on a given mountainside often. Novaculite glades and woodlands on these dry ridges, seeps and springs in the hollows. These are the Caddo Mountains, the Zigzag Mountains. You can see why they call it that. This is uh, up northeast of Hot Springs. The Fush Mountains, which run uninterrupted in very long east-west trending ridges, um, some of them from Little Rock all the way to Oklahoma with just a few breaks in these mountains, uh, sandstone and shale. You can uh, see there a big tornado path running right up uh, through there. We see a lot of tornadoes here. That's a natural disturbance process that has a big impact on the landscape. Also, because these ridges run east to west, we have very uh, distinct zonation of, of flora and fauna, really, on the north and south facing slopes of these ridges. Much hotter and drier on the south slope, typically dominated by shortleaf pine, post oak, black jack oak, black oak, some of the more xerophytic hickories. Uh, on the north facing slope, very often hardwood dominated, or at least not much pine, more white oak, northern red oak. On lower slopes, you might have a mesic forest of basswood. Um, northern red oak, ash. Lots of seeps and springs in the Washita Mountains, a lot of rare species of plants and animals associated with these. This is the Washita Mountain wooded acid seep community, community. Low pH, a lot of leaching, a lot of rare fern species, a lot of orchids. Uh, we also have a very rare habitat type. Um, in the Washita Mountains, 
Unfortunately, it's been mostly destroyed. We have thermal springs at Hot Springs. Uh, historically, there were 43 springs at Hot Springs. Uh, pretty much all of the major ones have been destroyed in one fashion or another, capped, piped. Uh, the entire bluff sides have been excavated uh, for the downtown. But uh, there is an endemic species of blue-green algae that occurs only in these thermal springs. And we have a great historical account from a botanist named George Engelman that visited the site in 1835 and described what was basically large calcareous thermal fins with all sorts of incredible flora that are gone today. Uh, he mentioned a lot about a southern flora that uh, he found there. He said the breath of the south blows through this valley. It never got uh, really cold because of all the thermal springs. Uh, there are coastal plain elements in the Washita's as well, disjunct, especially on Channel Scar Riverine wetlands, giant bald cypress, uh, and a lot of in endemism in these high quality uh, mountain rivers. There's the Caddo Mad Tom in the Washita River drainage headwaters, the uh, Washita Mad Tom in the Saline, uh, the Leopard Darter in the Cossatot, and other uh, mountain forks over in the western part of the state. We've got the Arkansas Valley, like the name implies. This was the valley of the Ar is the valley of the Arkansas River, which had a major impact on uh, that eco region. There are also, in ad in adjacent to the riverine lowlands, there's also uh, what we call the scattered high ridges and mountains ecoregion. These are high uh, plateau, like mesa-like uh, peaks out there with a flat top and very steep bluff line sides. A number of our highest uh, elevation areas in the Washington's, I mean, in the river valley are there. Like Mount Magazine, our highest peak, 2,753 uh, feet above sea level. A sky island with a disjunct flora. Some of you will go on a field trip there, I think. Um, a lot of grasslands in the river valley. This is uh, tall grass prairie remnants, Cherokee Prairie Natural Area, Flanagan Prairie Natural Area in western part of the state near Fort Smith. Some of the highest diversity grasslands in the central part of the continent. A lot of, uh, this is the most of our prairie that's left is in this area and there's not very much, but it, uh, some big blocks of over a thousand acres uh, in this area. Uh, the best on Fort Chaffee Military Reservation. A really intact prairie and savanna landscape, open woodlands, annual fire or fire every couple of years. Very similar. Uh, Thomas Nuttall traversed this same area in, eight, in 1819, and what he described seeing there you can still see today on Fort Chaffee. Uh, it's pretty spectacular. Uh, this is a shot there. The barren area in the foreground is not a man made disturbance, that is a saline uh, slick, saline barrens naturally uh, high sodium and magnesium content soil outcrops with a very rare flora, both vascular and non-vascular. Uh, and then true tall grass prairie remnants followed by or surrounded by oak savanna. Mississippi alluvial plain, as Scott talked about, uh, the big woods. This was part of the largest uh, bottomland forest complex in North America at one time. Uh, he told the story already, 91% of it was destroyed. Uh, there's effort going on to restore it, but we've already lost most of the bottomland forest. One of the biggest areas that remains, however, is in Arkansas, what we call the big woods, uh, between 500 and 600,000 acres of contiguous bottomland forest habitat, uh, the largest remaining left except for some down in Louisiana. And that's where it is over in eastern Arkansas. This is really the wildest country left in, in uh, Arkansas. There's a corridor 10 miles wide, three, three to 10 miles wide and 80 miles north to south of this kind of habitat left out there. Very wet, was never, uh, it was logged some, but it wasn't ever converted because it's just too wet to do anything else with. Trackless wilderness. Uh, but the higher surfaces in that area were converted to agriculture and now aquaculture uh, and rice farming as well. Uh, anything with a clay pan, the flat woods, the prairies were all destroyed uh, or, or most, a large part of them destroyed. But that just gives us some conservation priorities. The bottomland hardwood forests, 
uh, occurred throughout the state in our larger rivers, not in the Ozarks so much because there's really just no, or the Washtaws, there's really no big enough rivers to support them. One of the most impressive forests you'll ever see in North America is this one in uh, the Cache River and Bow de Vue, Vincent Creek watersheds. Um, there's a, a large area of forest there, uh, bald cypress trees, 800 to 1,000 years old, Tupelo 600 years old. You got super emergent uh, old growth cypress, 130 feet tall, and it's a large area. So it's not a, not just a few trees. This is a pretty big area. I think there's a field trip to the big woods, maybe, or, or might be if the water's high enough to float. Um, massive trees. That's Tom Foti, ecologist for natural heritage, for scale. He's a regular size guy. Um, massive. A lot of our state champion trees are in this area. Here's a, a large cow oak, Quercus michoei, a large honey locust. A new, new state champions found by Don Bragg from Forest Service. State champion nut all oak, White River Refuge. Gulf Coastal Plain to our south. There's grasslands, blackland prairie remnants, high pH, former Gulf of Mexico, fossiliferous, soft limestone and marl, chalk outcrops. Incredibly diverse, a lot of rare species. Showy beard tongue. But one of the most uh, important in terms of conservation uh, communities in the Gulf Coastal Plain are the pine flatwoods. And these are uh, loblolly and shortleaf pine woodlands and savannas, historically, that formed on older river terraces, abandoned terraces, uh, higher flood uh, ancient floodplains, along the Washita, Red, Little, and uh, Saline rivers and their tributaries. And there's different land surfaces. So those different colors are different, uh, different elevations, different ages of geomorphic surfaces, and they have a different flora. Of course, the younger ones are the wetter ones. The black is Holocene alluvium. And um, as you go up higher, you get into older and older uh, land surfaces, more, more lust development, more prairie flora. But these are all uh, largely converted to pine plantation. We are restoring this, as Scott mentioned, uh, thinning and burning. Um, to restore light on the ground. It's benefited uh, one of our endangered species of woodpecker, the red cacated woodpecker. Bill Holloman will be talking about that. Uh, very successful repatriation of uh, red cacated woodpeckers to Warren Prairie Natural Area. And I think there's a field trip as well to go down there and look at that. Very successful project on, at scale. Five to 6,000 acre project. Um, herbaceous seeps embedded at the breaks in these terraces and with the surrounding and, uh, sandy upland. Historically, these were open with a lot of fire, a lot of rare species, a lot of native orchids. Uh, Brent Baker, uh, botanist of the Natural Heritage Commission, found a very globally rare uh, trillium, the Texas trillium, new to Arkansas this year in one of these seepage wetlands, the G2 species. Uh, previously unknown from Arkansas, just from Texas and Louisiana. Great find. Uh, it's the range of that, plus Arkansas, Miller County. Um, big swamps, bottoms in uh, the uh, Little River and Red River in the coastal plain. This is a site uh, in the Little River bottoms that's one of the most important bird areas uh, that Audubon has recognized in the state. Uh, up to, I think, 17,000 uh, pairs of, of large colonial nesting birds in this area, in this, these swamps down there. This is the only place in the state where the alligator were really never extirpated. So we have kind of a native remnant alligator population. They've since recovered over a broader part of southern and eastern Arkansas, but 
uh, they were never eradicated from the Little River bottoms. And I've seen one down there that was about 15 feet long. And when you're out walking in the swamp and see something like that, you'll never forget it. Uh, but this, this area is really an incredible area for birds. Just some of the species here. I don't have time to get too much into them. Gallinules, whistling ducks, ibis, lots of egrets, wood stork, like millwood. A lot of great flora in these swamps as well. Carex decomposita, the epiphytic sedge, or cypress knee sedge, bottle brush sedge rush. A rare species that are uh, globally rare like the G2 species, uh, panicle indigo bush. There's a lot of great uh, mature forest on a few of the stream bottoms down in that part of the state, um, which leads some ecologists to not like this guy. Uh, I have a little bit of a different philosophy. I think um, I I'm fond of beaver uh, engineering and beaver wetlands and the flora that they bring, but um, not everyone feels the same. <laughs> That's, uh, again, Tom Fotai doing his part to control. It's a pretty large beaver, if you ask me. Um, but uh, they will destroy these, these nice old hardwood forests, uh, to be sure, in quick order. But these uh, diverse mosaics of open water marsh, shrub swamp, and forested wetlands that they leave behind to me is, uh, as a botanist is very fascinating. This is one of our natural areas, Poison Springs. Uh, the beaver are throughout the state, but these spring-fed coastal plain uh, streams are really where I see them doing the, their best work, really large uh, areas, um, making these extensive marshes, uh, flow tent marsh that you can walk on like a waterbed has a 18 rare plant species from Arkansas known from this habitat. Uh, pretty fascinating. It's the only habitat in the state for a number of species. Spring fed, mineral rich. Um, Crowley's Ridge, it's a little eco region, doesn't get a lot of attention. Uh, has more of an eastern uh, flora. Very erodible soils, this wind blown lus. Some of our very fertile, some of our largest uh, trees in the state are on this habitat. There's a nice old growth forest remnant in the St. Francis National Forest. You have massive uh, tulip poplars and beech trees, um, cucumber magnolias down there. It's the only, only place in the state where we get tulip poplar as a native tree is on Crowley's Ridge. And same with this. This is uh, Shizandra glaber, the climbing magnolia. Is that a two minute warning? Yes. Golly. All right, there's a lot of grasslands. We're restoring these with fire. And Aboriginal fire was a factor, but not entirely. That doesn't explain all of it. It's a great study by Fotai and Glenn looking at lightning ignition on wildfires. Uh, that was a major process as well. It predated the Aboriginal Americans by a long way. Well, I guess I'm out of time and just getting to the fauna. I was going to tell you about the return of the mountain lion. Definitely back. These are all pictures from recently. These game cameras have settled the, the deal. Uh, the question is now, are they um, breeding? Uh, don't know. Anyway, there's a lot more of Arkansas to see. I hope you'll stick around. I'll give a private showing to anybody who wants it tonight or tomorrow night. <laughs> or the last half of my talk. But um, thanks.